Hi, this is Nick Forster. We're going to share one of our favorite E-Town shows from the archives, and it starts right now. Live from E-Town Hall in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, it's E-Town with this week's musical guest from Okima, Oklahoma, John Fulbright. And from Northern California, very special guest, Bob Weir. I'm Helen Forster. Join me now in welcoming our host, if you will, Nick Forster. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Helen. Welcome to E-Town Hall our solar-powered uh, musical clubhouse. We're so glad you all could be with us this week. So there is a lot of hope in making original music. Hope that you can capture something special as a songwriter. Hope that you can record that and play it in a way that does the original inspiration justice. Hope that an audience will connect with what you created. Uh, and then the loftier stuff. Hope that your songs will stand the test of time. We have got uh, two guests this week who are approaching this classic creative puzzle from different angles. One, John Fulbright, who's amazing and talented, and also pretty early on in, in his career, but he's a great singer, great songwriter and performer. And then we've got one who has been in a band for more than 50 years that's in some ways helped redefine American roots and popular music, um, but he's still looking for that elusive combination, looking to make music that connects in real time, uh, so this should be fun. Up first, one of the founding members and lead singers for The Grateful Dead, the band that um, really broke new ground ever since their first gigs in 1965, always experimenting, innovating, trying things out, sometimes failing, but always engaging their audience, uh, inviting that audience to be a part of something, a shared experience that could rise above the normal. They created an incredible community of fans, as you all know. They sold a zillion records, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, all of that. But um, this, uh, this founding member of that particular band has a new record out that's called Blue Mountain. He's got a full schedule of shows, and, and we know that this particular musician is still chasing that elusive goal, that, uh, that magical puzzle of making music and making it last. Please welcome back to E-Town, our good friend, Mr. Bob Weir. I'm going to start out with a tune. I'm going to start out with a tune that uh, that I did on my last record. It's the one that kind of got me started on the uh, cowboy tunes kick. Now imagine yourself like 50 or 60 years ago in a, in a bunkhouse in in Wyoming or somewhere like that, and. Uh, bunch of old cowpokes who'd grown up before the era of radio. So their idea was to how, how to kill an evening was to maybe pop a, a cork and tell stories and sing songs. And this is one of them. Blue Mountain, your azure deep. Blue Mountain, your sides are steep. Blue Mountain, with a horse head on your side You stolen my love to keep You stolen my love to keep Well, I was born in a manger in Texas The pendles and paints all come round My days there were troubled and reckless all the bad news I looked for I found So I woke and wore thin down in Texas For reasons you won't want to know So I roped and I broke in a ramble too Where the sage and the pinion grow Blue Mountain, your azure deep Blue Mountain, your side are steep Blue Mountain with a horse head on your side 
You stole my love to keep. You stole my love to keep. And now I rope with a lot of gold Gordon. I drank at the Blue Goose Saloon. And I dance all night with the Mormon girls. Ride home my way lit by the moon. Oh, here is the snake in the rainbow And here is the balsam and bow And here are the ladders of light up to heaven A blue mountain is all I need now Blue mountain, your azure deep Blue mountain, your sides pristine Blue mountain with a horse head on your side You stole my love to keep You stole my love to keep So what kind of cut purse is the evening To scatter her diamonds behind We're out giving the first and the last love Blue Mountain will be most of mine Blue Mountain, your azure deep Blue Mountain, your sides are steep Blue Mountain with a horse head on your side You stole my love to keep You stole my love to keep
the ground Cross my heart and I hope to die I was just hanging out with the other guy Saying yeah, 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 yeah Singing thank you Come on. I'm going to do a tune from uh, from the record I put out. Like I think it was last year. Blood runs in your veins as well. Dig a hole. 
dig a hole in the meadow Dig a hole in the cold, cold ground Dig a hole, dig a hole in the meadow Your visit to E-Town is made possible in part by the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, or SCFD, one of the largest cultural funding mechanisms in the United States, supporting nearly 300 organizations in the greater Denver area, and by our diverse family of NPR affiliates and community stations, plus college and commercial stations, as well as our international stations and podcast subscribers worldwide. Thank you for your continued support. You're listening to E-Town. I'm Nick Forster. I'd like to say hello to our listeners who are hearing E-Town on stations like WNCS, The Point in Burlington and Montpelier, Vermont, on KJAC, the Colorado Sound in Fort Collins and all over the state of Colorado, and our newest stations, KCHW, Northern Lights Public Radio in Chuella, Washington. Um, as always, if you want more information about our show, you want to see uh, photos and videos of this week's program, you want to buy tickets to the show or find out anything you want to know about E-Town, all that's on the web at etown.org. So um, first of all, let me just say uh, welcome back, Bob Weir. It's been a long time since you've been on E-Town. I think right. it's like 25 years or something. So. Something like that. Yeah. Too long. Glad to. Glad to have you back. Let me also say you are an underrated guitar player. You know, you're all, you're, you're, you've been in a band with these flashy guitar players, oh, and, you know, you're solid and good in that way that very few people are. Um, we got to hear a couple songs from your new record, which is called Blue Mountain. 
kind of a collection of cowboy songs. Is that music that you paid attention to when you were a little kid, like cowboy movies and cowboy songs? Well, uh, you know, it's a story that I've told before, but uh, when I was 15, I thought it would be a terribly romantic thing to do to run away and be a cowboy, so I did. And, um, and so, I, you know, I found myself on a ranch in, uh, in west-central Wyoming with a bunch of old boys who, uh, who, you know, they'd grown up without radio before radio had gotten the f that far. So singing songs and telling stories was what you did it at yeah. night. I have to ask you about um, the details of that a little bit. So I'm just trying to think about 15-year-old kids who might be listening to this radio show and thinking, yeah, that sounds romantic. I think I'd like to be a cowboy. How did you actually manifest that? Did you just tell your parents that, by the way, I'm taking off and I'm going to go and hitchhike to Wyoming? Or how did you find yourself on a ranch in Wyoming? I had enough money so I could ride a bus most of the way, but some, some of it was hitchhiking. <laughs> okay, and, and then you got there, and then you're just hanging out for like a week, a month, a couple months? or how? Uh, summer. Yeah, wow. Wow, and so you, um, did you know how to ride a horse? You know, I didn't spend much time on horseback. Now, I knew how to ride at that point, yeah. but, uh, but most of the time I spent sitting on a tractor or shoveling stalls. Yeah. Bailing hay and, yeah. Well, that's cool, but you got exposed to the cowboy culture, and as you say, this was sort of no radio. You're out there just singing songs and telling stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> I have a feeling an image popped into your head right around then. <laughs> but you were already probably kind of a folky by that point, right? Yeah, I was a budding folky. Yeah. And I, but I was aware that this is true American folk music, the kind that you don't hear on the radio because it's not, you know, it wasn't cool. You know, cowboy tunes weren't cool at that point. But, right. you know, that first one, uh, Blue Mountain, I think that was written back in the 20s by some guy. I, you know, I rewrote it with, uh, with Josh Ritter a little bit, you know, maybe a, a minor core here where it might not have been, but it might have been. You couldn't really tell and, uh, and, re, and had, to, had a little bit of liberty with the, uh, with the lyric as well. Yeah. I think it was, wasn't it Hal Cannon who kind of helped s resurrect that song from an oral tradition into a thing? It was cool. That's a beautiful song. I know that the, the folky thing affected all of us, you know, that just finding a guitar or a banjo and listening to records, and whether it was a Vanguard record or, or however we found our way into that path right. where everybody can and could play music. That was just such a beautiful concept. And I think that was, wasn't it the banjo that sort of led you to your eventual bandmate and uh, Yeah, partner? I was, I was wandering the back streets of, uh, of Palo Alto with a, a couple of friends. It was New Year's Eve of 1960. Three going on 64, I think. And uh, we heard banjo music coming out of the, the back of uh, the music shop. And we, you know, we knew where we were and we knew who that was. We knew it was Jerry. And so, you know, you know we were young and strong and feeling bold. And we just knocked on the door. I was 16 by then. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and Jerry came to the door. And, you know, we, I guess I kind of invited us in. And he was waiting for his students to arrive, and I, you know, I, I didn't have a watch at the time, but I know it was uh, like 7:30 or something. And, you know, I prized him of the, you know, it's, you know, it's like 7:30 on New Year's Eve, and I don't think they're coming. <laughs> and and he uh, he allowed us. Yeah, I, you got a point there. <laughs> well, you guys play instruments. You know, he didn't want to leave. He he wanted to make sure that in case somebody came. He was there, so uh, you guys play instruments? Yeah, yeah, we play instruments. Oh, well, okay, I got the keys to the front of the store. I'll, well, let's go get and grab some and, and kick some tunes around, which we did for, you know, a few hours and had a great time and, and yucked it up a bunch and decided we'd had too much fun to just walk away from, so we decided we were going to make a, a little jug band. Jug bands were big back then. Right. Jug bands were cool because they were like bluegrass bands with less rules. <laughs> Well, the jug band music is interesting. It, it, uh, it was, the jug band musicians were, uh, the, the minstrel musicians, they were the same guys playing the same stuff on the riverboats, they were minstrel musicians. On the street corner, they were jug band musicians, yeah. the same, same stuff. Yeah. Interestingly, that all happened along the, the river system, the Ohio and the Mississippi, mostly. And uh, in the years that followed, the, the 20s, when the 20s and early 30s, when the jug band music was, you know, as 
it, you know, it really becomes sort of a thing. Then jazz took over, big bands and stuff like that. And the riverboats started having bands with horns in them and stuff like, and, you know, so, it was, you know, it was more like Dixieland or what we call Dixieland. That's, I guess, New Orleans traditional. Trad jazz, yeah. Um, but that, that music kept cooking along, but, you know, over the years, the electric bass got added, the, the hi-hat you know, drum kit and the hi-hat cymbal and stuff like that. In, in all those same cities where there were hot beds for uh, jug band music became hot beds for funk music. It's the same stuff, the same scales, the same rhythms, the same subject matter. It's all the same stuff. It's just they call it funk now. So you're telling me that the Warlocks in its early incarnation was really a funk band? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay. But you had, the, you, had a, well, you had a jug band first, and um, I remember reading something that Jerry said, because Jerry did, um, you know, Jerry Garcia, by the way, who would be 75 years old. Yeah. He took the time to really dive into bluegrass and bluegrass banjo playing in a very disciplined way. I mean, he really got into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And eventually found it constraining. Yeah. Um, but he liked the fact that he felt like it was part of the DNA of what became the Grateful Dead because he called it conversational music. Does that resonate for you? Does that sound Yeah, it, it, you know, it's back and forth. You, uh, there were a lot of trade and fours and, uh, and, uh, and support lines and yeah. all that kind of stuff that, uh, well, that exists in other schools of music, but he found it. He really, you know, he located those strains in bluegrass music and uh, was able to... Uh, to embody that, and it became apparent that he was playing, you know, it became apparent to a 16-year-old kid that he was playing a line that needed support. You know, he didn't even say it. He was just, the way he played it, it needed mm -hmm. support, so I'd play the support line. And that's how our music developed in a conversational manner. Yeah. No, it's cool. And, and I like the fact that, you know, there he is, he's developing the style, and you have this conversational opportunity to play music. He doesn't feel like the bluegrass scene is free enough because it's got too many rules. And then from there, it's just a pretty short leap to the acid tests, where there's really no rules at all, no expectations, and anything can happen. <laughs> well, people could walk in there with expectations. <laughs> that um, wouldn't last long, yeah. <laughs> and, and again, I don't want to, this isn't just like, this is your life, Bob Weir, you know, we're not going to say, and here's your first grade teacher. Um, the, the idea, though, is that there's some of these images from the early days of, of The Grateful Dead that I still puzzle over, one of which, as a guy who's been in bands for many years, um, the fact that you all lived in the same house for two or three years. Right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I just can't even conceive of that, how you would... The rhythm section uh, tucked tail and ran. <laughs> <laughs> Phil and Billy moved up up the hill uh, after about a year and a half or two, but we stuck it out at uh, seven ten for the longest yeah. time. Did you figure out like uh, you know whose food was whose in the refrigerator, or who got to play? Who chose what records to play? Uh, you know, it was we sniffed it out. It yeah. was it was it was totally democratic. <laughs> and then. And, and what kind usually, of... Usually, the records that got played were the ones that we, we figured would get... Neil Cassidy was living with us. The one, whatever we figured would get him most animated. Sort of like the equivalent of television or something? Like, right. So, yeah. you know, Miles Davis, he was big on that. You yeah. Know, we play a little John Coltrane. He, you know, he could bop to that stuff. <laughs> and... Um, but you, you had an opportunity to try stuff out. Like, you listen to some records, you say, hey, let's, let's see what we can build on that. And yeah, oh, yeah, we, we stole stuff from like records. What we, where we, oh, come on, all, all art is clever that's, at that's that. That's what you do, yeah. But uh, where a lot of our tunes came from, the other one, the tune that, uh, one of the early tunes that I wrote, uh, for instance, the groove for a lot of the tunes that we first wrote, and, you know, and it's, it's still happens is that you turn on the radio and it comes on and it's in the middle of the song somewhere and you don't know where in the bar you are and you, you, there's absolutely no sense to it and as soon as you, you decide this little clip here makes sense you turn it off and go in and grab your instrument and uh, it's absolutely it comes out absolutely nothing like this you have no, still have no idea what song right. you were listening to it's like the musical equivalent of M.C. Escher where you just right yeah yeah <laughs> You don't know where it begins or ends, right. but you snatch a little piece of it and yeah. have an experience. I think that happens with world music sometimes, where 
you know, a white guy like me is trying to listen to some African music and I think, oh yeah, I'm grooving. And then I realize, oh, I, I can't even find the one. I can't even right. find the downbeat here. This right. is so more sophisticated. This is some really deep cultural tradition that I'm not hip to. So Right. Well, when we went to Egypt, uh, we went up the Nile River, which is south, and uh, we got up into the Nubian Desert area and they'd see a boat coming, one of those, I think they call them fallacious or something like that. And... Uh, and see it coming, uh, the, the people from these little riverside villages, and they'd play and sing and clap by the riverbank, hoping for, you know, a little bakshish. And uh, it was really incredibly sophisticated and powerful what those guys could do. Like mm -hmm. half a dozen guys standing, or maybe eight guys standing on the riverbank, uh, one or two of them had the uh, tar tars. A tar is a, uh, like a, a jumbo tambourine without the spangles. And you know, so it's a drum, and they you know they, they get all kinds of different tones out of it, and the other guys are all clapping and stomping their feet, and mm -hmm. it's complex. The uh, the yeah. the patterns go on for a long time before they repeat, uh, and uh, those guys are good at it because they spend a lot of time doing it. Yeah, that must sounds like that must have been an amazing trip. That was when you went to play in Egypt at the pyramids, is that right? Yeah, I saw a clip of you and Jerry on the David Letterman show talking about that experience in which Jerry said, oh yeah, that was a great trip, but we sucked. Yeah, we, we played horribly. <laughs> Billy had a broken arm. Uh, you know, when your drummer's got a broken arm, and it's the one that he hit his snare drum with. Oh, God. Uh, so, you you know, needed we to were... find those guys by the river to help you out, probably. And, and, and Mickey, the other drummer, is, is not, you know, his whole style isn't all that focused on holding on, down the back. time, beat. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, that plus the fact, that plus the fact that uh, the electricity in Egypt at that time, you know, it was on again, off again, on again, off again. So, we didn't get much of a chance to sound check because we'd get there and sound check and we'd get, uh, you know, two or three bars into a tune and everything went dead. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, the pictures were amazing. Yeah. Well, there was a, there was a moment there. I, the, the evening of one of the sound checks, uh, while the guys were messing with the stage equipment, I took a little walk around the, the amphitheater there. And the amphitheater is thousands of years old. It's right at the foot of the Sphinx. The Sphinx is right at the foot of the Great Pyramid. And so I'm wandering around, and I guess I got the geometry right. You know, I, I got lined up so that the Great Pyramid... I, no, I think the head of the uh, Chephren, the Middle Pyramid, or the, the point of that was directly in line with, you know, right between the ears of the Sphinx. And uh, I had a moment where everything sort of went... Uh, I, I felt a timelessness about it. You know, I, I, it was, everything sort of reverberated, you know, off to my left, off to my right, but barbershop mirror is forever. And so the next night, you know, I, 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 you know, I sort of slapped myself and said, that's, a, that's remarkable, and yeah. went, on about, uh, went about, on about my evening. The, the next night, we go on and it's dusk. The house lights go down. They're, it's outdoors, but there were lights in the amphitheater, and they go down. We come on stage. The stage lights come up, and we're the warmest, brightest thing for miles. And it's right there by the river, by the Nile, and you don't think about it because it's a desert. You don't think about mosquitoes, but oh, boy, they got them. Wow. And, um, you know, I, I looked at my arm, and it was covered with mosquitoes, and I brushed it off. And then the other one, by the time I was done brushing the other one off, the first arm was covered with mosquitoes wow. again. And I'm thinking, okay, welcome to hell. Yeah. And, um, and then whew, this dark form flew by my head. Another one. Another one. And I looked across the stage, and there were these bats about <laughs> a foot, foot and a half across. Right. Big bats. Big, big guys. And lots and lots wow. of them. Like maybe thousands of them. Um, these are the things people don't know when they're just listening to the show and going, God, these guys are having a tough night. Well, so, so they're, they're taking out the bats. And I had another moment where you know, it was, take me now, Lord, I want to remember it just like this. Because if you, if you think about it, 
here's a here's a rock. Back off. I left my body at that point. I, I sort of. <laughs> And I, I'm looking at us from the stage, from about 100 yards or you know 50 yards off. Here's a rock and roll band at the foot of the Sphinx, at the foot of the Great Pyramid, all lit up really nice and pretty like a color TV going all haywire, surrounded by a cloud of bats. And <laughs> you know that would be a good place to just sort of step yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hence the title of the documentary, What a Long Strange Trip It's Been. Because <laughs> there's lots of stories like that. Yeah. Like playing at Woodstock and getting shocked every time you hold your guitar. Right, yeah. I mean, it was just amazing stuff. I do want to say we've got a lot of music, and we're going to actually have a chance to chat later on in the show. But um, just talking about the music and talking about your guitar playing, I know Keith Richards has talked about the art of having two electric guitars in a rock and roll band. Right. And how it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's pretty hard to do. Did you naturally fall into the role, you and Jerry, of finding yeah. um, how that worked? Or did you have to sort of like try this, work on this? Well, just sort of how you heard the, a little the of pulse both. of the songs? A little of both. We both listened to the same stuff because we were living in the same house. And so the, there was one good sound system in there. And so we were listening to the same stuff and talking about it and... Uh, you know, for instance, I'd listen to McCoy Tyner supporting John Coltrane, playing with the tonality, playing with, you know... He was just sort of feeding uh, Coltrane stuff to work off of, and I've, nobody does that. Why, do, why does nobody do that? i got to do that. Right. And, uh, you know, because nobody does it on guitar. A lot of people do it on piano. Let's see if I can do it with, you know, and make it sound like rock and roll. Yeah. That was where it took off. Yeah, well, it, it, was a, it was an amazing combination, and, and it still is. I mean, I got to see the uh, old version and the new version, and it's a, it's a cool role, and as I said at the top, you know, you're sort of underrated as a real force in, that, in the pulse of those songs. Um, and I know from spending time with you that you are still a guy who just loves to play music. You just, yeah. You just want to play yeah. all the time. Yeah. We just came back from... Uh, a camp that we uh, we attended where we we were playing all the time. Yeah, we played for yeah if all day. You, we, you know, I was there for only three nights, and I would venture to say that I was playing more than I would have done on tour. More, yeah. I, I I wouldn't venture to say. I know I did like about twice as much. Yeah. No, it's fun, and that trend is going to continue. We've got more music right now. So um, thanks for coming. Thanks you for bet. coming back. Thanks for being a part of this, especially here at E Town Hall. And uh, we, let's get back to music. Welcome back, if you would, Bob Weir. I should say that we were talking about what songs to do over the last few days. And uh, Bobby sent me a list of about 200 songs. He said, here's some songs that I know. <laughs> really, you know all these songs? You know the words to all these songs? It's amazing. It's frightening.
I'm gonna get my fill somehow Rivers of corn and wheat and white Old sand and gold All on the sea Oh, 
with my words that glow With the gold of sunshine And my tunes were played Oh, my heart unstrung Don't you hear my voice Come through with the music Thoughts are broken Perhaps They're better They're unsung Well, I don't know Don't really care Let there be song Be empty if your cup is full. May it be again. Let it be known. There is a fountain that was not made by the hands of man. simple highway between the dawn and the dark of night if you should go no one may follow that path is for your steps along That's Bob Weir, along with Steve Kimmett on the guitar. He tones Ron Jolly, Chris Engelman, Kristen Teal, Helen Forster singing harmony. These guys will be back to play lots more music in just a little while. This portion of E-Town is made possible by the Bohemian Foundation, building stronger communities through the Bohemian qualities of creativity and imagination. On the web at bohemianfoundation.org. As a reminder, for your viewing pleasure, there are over 2,000 videos on the E-Town YouTube channel, where you can also subscribe in order to stay up to date with our latest offerings. And if you're curious about E-Town's home base, E-Town Hall, our beautiful solar-powered music venue, community center, and recording studio located in downtown Boulder, Colorado, you can learn more about it on our website, etown.org. You're listening to E-Town. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm Nick Forster. You're listening to E-Town. I just want to mention that that some of the material we just heard from uh, from Bob's new record is really his first solo record in about 10 years, and I think it's the first album of original material that has some original material in more than that, like 30 years or something like that. Anyway, that record's called Blue Mountain. We've got more music from Bob Weir coming up later on in the show. Right now, uh, I want to tell you about what's coming next. Um, John Fulbright is from a small town Oklahoma. He went to Okima High School. He got to start playing at the Woody Guthrie Festival. He quickly went on to write and perform and record his original songs that connected so immediately uh, with critics and fans. He was getting compared to legendary artists like Towns Van Zant and Neil Young. I happen to think that he's in a category all his own because his, his writing, his singing, and playing, his, his energy, that all comes from who he is and, and where he comes from. Anyway, he's put out two solo records. A third is on the way. He's toured all over the place. He's gotten rave reviews from the LA Times and NPR and the Wall Street Journal, and he's still in his 20s. I have to say that in many years of doing this show, he's really one of my favorite artists. I'm really glad he could be uh, a part of this special show this week. And I mentioned that at the top, just that we've got this musical journey, this musical quest coming from two different angles. And uh, I'm just glad that John is here. Please welcome back to E-Town, if you would, John Fulbright. Thank you, guys. A song called God Above. Six long days on the seventh day, he rested. Said there's one sure way humans can be bested. Give them wine and song, fire and lust. When it all goes wrong, I'm the man to trust. And now you're all my own, all mine together. Will you sing my praise? Sing my name.
a song, uh, it's a love song. It's called She Knows. Well, she knows a thing or two about me. She didn't learn in passing She knows I'm scared of the dark She knows I'll bleed on command She knows I'll shut my mouth She'll take my hand And just how cruel I can be she knows a thing or two about me. I'm Helen Forster. You know, we're out of time this week, but we'll pick things up again with this song next week. So join us for part two of this special two-part program. She knows a thing or two about rain. She calls it home. This is a production of E-Town.